Okay, so I think we are good to go. Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Naseem Nakhvi, uh, and we have uh, this uh, some excellent speakers for this session, how to write a world-class research paper. And I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sean Mannion, who is uh, our senior editor at the JBBA and also chief scientific um, officer at Consensus Health. So over to you, Sean. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you once again for hosting of us, uh, hosting us in a wonderful event, uh, virtual this time, but uh, I still have memories of Scotland uh, last year. ISC uh, 2020 was the last in-person meeting I attended. So, um, you know, you, 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 have a, you have a strong place in my heart. Um, and uh, I, I am here today. Uh, my name is Sean Mannion. I am uh, Chief Scientific Officer at Consensus Health, and I, I work with uh, the, the staff at uh, JBBA to do, to do review and, and, and look at the papers that, that come in. Um, and with me today, I have uh, Dr. Chen Liu, uh, Dr. Adam Hayes, and, and Dr. R. K. Uh, Shamasundar. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about what it takes to, to make a world-class paper. And uh, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's important when you talk about world-class papers is not every world-class paper needs to be world-changing. You know, we can't all be Satoshi and Nakamoto and, and, and write that white paper. Um, the, solid, the solidness of even the smallest piece in, in what I like to call the wall of science or the wall of evidence is very important. And it's so, so it's more the quality that is there than, than, the, than the overall size, because the overall size of a lot of small pieces can be just as big as one big piece. Um, my, my background is in neuroscience. I, I come from the world of, of uh, basic research, and then I moved into clinical research as a research administrator. I've written a few papers, but I've definitely uh, reviewed and, and, and uh, helped guide uh, a large amount of staff through, through more. Um, since entering the blockchain space about five years ago, I've been looking at blockchain applications in healthcare and life sciences. I've gotten to work with the, the JBBA staff that do wonderful work to put sort of uh, the legacy system of peer review and evidence base into this new world. And I think that's wonderful that they're, that they're able to do that. Um, and so I'm going to invite um, the other panelists to just give you a little bit of the, the, their background, the 60 second version. And then we're going to talk about what, what, what some of the tips and, and tricks are for, for really writing a, a world class paper across different subfields of blockchain because blockchain is one area that covers a lot of different areas. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pass it along to uh, um, uh, Professor Liu. Uh, you first, please. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me in this wonderful conference. And uh, this is one of the few conferences I attend um, online. And I find we are also able to foster in this community, close community with this blockchain uh, world. Um, so my name is Dr. Chen Liu. I'm the editor of JBBA, uh, focusing on finance and token economics. Um, I am finance professor, professor of finance and entrepreneurship. I do a lot of research um, in finance, entrepreneurship, uh, startup financing. And um, I also uh, work in the industry. Um, I co-founded a company called CoinChain Capital. Um, it's a blockchain tech and a business solution provider. We worked a lot with the industry and helped them mostly with the token economics and also the underlying um, technology of it. I'm also the MBA director of Trinity Western University. Uh, so my role here is really to help you to understand this um, uh, publishing uh, publication world and how um, to write publications, research papers that editors like to reveal. Excellent, thank you. And uh, going to you, Professor Hayes. So I'm Adam Hayes. Um, I hold graduate degrees in economics and sociology. I'm a professor of sociology and anthropology well, in a joint department, but I, I am a social scientist of finance and economics from that kind of background. Uh, and that's what my work, my own work and research looks at. And I especially look at questions around um, social and interactional and relational implications of financial technologies, including blockchain. I have several publications um, relating to Bitcoin blockchain, including a, a Bitcoin pricing model from a few years back that still seems. And uh, I've also taught for the um, online master's degree program at the University of Nicosia in digital currencies. And right now I'm at the University of Wisconsin and I'll be starting in the fall at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. That is excellent. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Professor uh, Shaima, Sundar, or Sha Shaima Sundar, could you please uh, give us a little bit of background on you? Yeah, I'm Professor R.K. Shaima Sundar. 
I am at a distinguished professor at the Indian Institute of Technology at Bombay. I am also a National Academy of Science Platinum Jubilee Senior Scientist and also uh, the uh, in charge of the Center for Blockchain Research supported by Ripple. I also work on land coins and particularly I'm interested in the uh, smart uh, contract correctness because that is the key factor for all the applications uh, kind of a thing. And I have also worked on, because of the XRP and the Ripple, we have been working on what is the volatility and how it is useful for uh, inter-border exchange of money and the things of that nature. And I also teach at the National Institute of Technology for industrial engineering on the blockchain uh, and its applications. And this is also the right time. We have the chief person on evidence-based and COVID vaccine is the one where you have a lot of evidence-based. You can derive whatever evidence you want. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And 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 yes, I mean you kind of uh, all three of you cross different areas in, in in finance and economics and 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 the more more technical components. And I come from the healthcare background. There are similarities, but there are differences to publishing on on each of these things. And and when you're publishing on blockchain and the intersection of these, sometimes it can be challenging for people to know what to do. Um, you know, there are some there are some basics that I come with. Uh, you know, when I talk about papers, it, something should be novel. Um, you know, you can't just repeat exactly as someone did before unless you. You are trying to replicate and then that itself is something novel um you you need something important something non-trivial it doesn't have to be world changing as i said but it can't just be oh if i change these letters around in blockchain like hodl and people think it's funny that's that's not probably worthy of a paper um you know uh, and and it needs to be rigorous and i think that that's a, a, an important thing um to have the academic rigor which also means making sure you're giving contribution uh, noting contributions for those people who've done things that you're building off of or who have done similar things because if you're not aware of the broad swath of the field you're saying things that maybe have already been said and and and, and that can be challenging to 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 make it really worthwhile to put a paper together that doesn't fit into the framework of what has come before and and of course it, it, especially for original research it needs to be thorough in in describing what you did um, so that it can be replicable if uh, you know everything that in there is something that somebody else has resources to do they should be able to do it and compare to see if they say, got the same results um, which is very important from a research uh, standpoint. That said, there are nuances that we've all learned throughout our careers, both writing papers and reviewing papers. So starting with you, um, uh, Pro Professor uh, Shaima Sundar, I wonder if you could tell us, um, you know, how do you write a, a world-class research paper? What goes into that? What are the, some of the things you would recommend? See, one of the uh, fundamental things of late where there has been enormous number of papers that are being generated is to see a person should feel that his precondition and the post condition are different when he writes a paper it is something like if you put a butterfly am i enthused to say that this is the one that i need to publish as you say it need not be disrupting but if somebody reads it he should gain a knowledge of what it is kind of a thing or the other whether it is original or whether it is recast that is a different issue but it's very important that uh, you give proper credit where you have read what you have understood and then where it is going to be. These are all things that has to be made. The honesty of the person in understanding and conveying what he thinks is not there to the other is an important aspect, both for a new project or a proposal or a paper. Because of late, proposals look to be more important compared to the a papers kind of a thing or the other. Very true and very, very, very well said. I, I think that that sort of um, reference to those things that brought you to the conclusions or brought you to where you you wanted to go and write about is, is very important and fitting into the field. Um, uh, uh, moving, moving to uh, uh, Professor Liu. Um, what about in in a, in a finance paper? Are there are there different aspects to um, you know what what are the key ingredients, if you will, for for a world class research paper? So um, I wrote a paper in that got published in Small Business Economics in the early 2020. And at the time, so back in 2019, 2020, um, there's not a lot of awareness of blockchain in the finance and entrepreneurship uh, academic world. And now there are more and more. And the interest coming from the academic world is you're able to fit the blockchain research into the traditional economics finance theory. 
Um, so if you think about it, uh, think about the token size. So when you're doing designing the tokens, how does that fit into the economic literature? How does that work with the game theory? Um, so um, think when you're looking at the tokens, you're issuing a token, when, whether it's a utility token or whether it's a security token, you're mimicking the, uh, the financing tools and then try to link that with the uh, finance theory on token issuing or equity issuing. Look at the all the theory that apply to equity financing or um, fundraising could be applied in the blockchain world. Not, not, not that they're truly fit, but you can use that as a background knowledge so you speak truly to the academics. And also think about um, if you look at the tokens, how that, um, what's the implication for governance, corporate governance, how that's uh, for the internal control, um, monitoring mechanism. Um, so I think for me, the key aspect is how do you fit that into the traditional finance economics literature and there is it's it's not you come up with something new that doesn't speak to the traditional side you need to help the traditional people see the value of your research and say hey that's something new the technology is new the um, application can be new scenario use it can be new but then it also fit within the theory or maybe you do you find that doesn't fit with existing theory so you develop new theory so for me it's really important that you fit um, fit it into the literature and then show your contribution very true very true and that's and that's something that 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 people in, who've been in academia can understand. But that's sometimes something that people who've who've come at this from from more on the technology side and the industry side may not have experience with. So it's it's just a, it's a learning curve. Um, moving to you, Professor Hayes, uh, what uh, what do you see as as some of the key aspects um, for you know economics papers, but uh, but social sciences papers in general where it intersects with blockchain? Sure. Um... And first of all, I'll, I'll mention that my the first publication I had on on blockchain, there was, I sent it initially to finance and economics journals, and they didn't know. This was in 2014 when it was sent out for review, and the editors were like, "What is this? This is a flash in the pan!" And I got desk rejected everywhere, and ended up going into an information systems journal called Telematics and Informatics because they um, ended up being more uh, amenable to this new thing. But it's funny how much the world has changed so rapidly. And it's great that the JBVA has a journal that is dedicated to uh, an interdisciplinary approach to this. And what's interesting about this journal is that while it's interdisciplinary, it's not that a paper crosses disciplines necessarily, although it can. And it's encouraged that a single paper uh, cross between different sciences or different uh, fields of study. It's that you'll find a technical paper side by side, a theoretical essay, followed by a commentary and followed by a financial or economics directed paper. So I think it's a great venue for a variety of different paper types. Now, all these paper types have to have certain elements. It doesn't matter whether or not it's a social science paper or it's a you know, physics or technology, digital, you know, computer science oriented paper. So you're going to need to basically make a contribution to the literature or to our knowledge, the body of knowledge, and, and uh, what Sean was calling the, the wall of knowledge. You have to make a contribution. And you have to tell us what the contribution is. Don't take for granted that we or the reviewers or the readers are going to know what your contribution is. So don't be shy in saying, I advance this literature or this research by doing this. And if you make more than one contribution, spell it out. So one of the mistakes that people make, A, is that they don't make a contribution, but think they are. And second, they are making a contribution, but they don't tell us what it is. So it's buried and we have to search for it. And we might come to the wrong conclusions about what that contribution is. So tell us. The second thing is that the paper is there's usually two types of academic or scholarly paper. The first is a empirical paper, which you're doing research. And in this case, you need to tell us what is your research question, right? Uh, you might have a great idea, <clears throat> but that doesn't necessarily make for a research question. Once you have your research question, you need to have something, you don't need to have formal hypotheses, but you need to be testing something with your empirical work, with your uh, methods. And coming from social sciences, um, 
I am agnostic whether or not your methods are quantitative or are qualitative. I think both have merit. So, but you need to um, have a research question and then answer that research question with your data and methods. A lot of times the front end of the paper does not match the data. And what the question that you're actually answering is not the question that you're saying you're going to set out to answer. In a theoretical paper, you have to make, even though you might not be It can't just be um, an essay that you would maybe write for uh, a course that you took in college, for example. You need to be, um, it has to be well-researched in the sense that you need to be citing other scholars that have written on the same topic as you. But if you're saying, okay, I have a theory of how blockchain um, is a new type of organizational form, you're going to need to engage with the organizational theory scholarship. And you're going to need to engage with the debates about what's going on in organizational theory, because not every organizational, there isn't one canon, there are debates. So you need to acknowledge those debates and where your contribution lies. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and a number of great points there. I, one, one I want to dive into it with, with, with each of you and, and, and to stop on a bit is, is, is the, the somewhat conflict between the speed of how things move in the blockchain world. In blockchain and healthcare, uh, there, was a, there was a white paper contest in 2016 that was held that really, by and large, was sort of like the first takeoff of, of looking at applications. I mean, 70 people submitted, or 70 groups submitted, so there were already work going on, but I don't think I've seen sort of a collection of things come together in healthcare before that point. And that was less than five years ago, and the amount of, that has been written and been put together since then is has been tremendous. So it, the, the speed at which things go is, is amazing. But then sometimes there's the, I call it the slow cooking of, of academic writing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to my tech team sometimes and they'll say, oh, did you did you work on that thing, Sean? And I said, oh, I thought you meant that was working at academic speed because that's an idea. I'm used to kicking that soccer ball back and forth with somebody for months before we even put pen to paper. I mean, really, a lot of times the slow cooking of an academic paper is, is a very thought inducing process. It really starts to tease out certain things. You got to dive into the literature, read and reread ideas that that if it takes you six months to put together a paper in a, in a, in a world that's moving this quickly, it can sometimes be a conflict. Um, how do you, how do you address that speed or, or where do you, do you see the, the, the difficulty in blockchain meeting um, the blockchain industry meeting the other academic areas out there? And we'll, and we'll start with uh, uh, Professor uh, Shaima Sundar. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the important thing is one has to look purely blockchain from an application perspective. That is one vision. The another one is what are the things that are calling called for like regulatory bodies? For example, you have permissionless blockchains and permission blockchains. The regulatory bodies don't like permissionless uh, uh, blockchains. So now you have to see what are the things that would be needed to make even uh, <coughs> uh, permission blockchains good. That means that it leads to another point, for example, identity. How do I now going to verify digital credentials because it's a challenge? Can it be scalable? Can it be like a DNS uh, a protocol? Many of them have come up uh, recently, and that is where now a few good blockchain technology paper belongs to some of these aspects that are integrated so that regulatory bodies accept because the application can become large only if the regulatory bodies accept. Otherwise, it will not have uh, much value. And of late, privacy is playing a very vital role. Now, blockchain, in some sense, is not a thing which preserves automatically privacy. Now, what are the things that could be done to preserve uh, privacy, uh, like a healthcare? For example, zero knowledge proof, how it can be integrated. And that becomes a very important issue. The most important question from a financial sector people would ask is scalability. Of late, there have been many protocols, like Avalanche protocol that has come from Cornell, which uses metastability. 
So in some sense, you randomly select many of them to say that you come up with the consensus so that this will not, this will remain immutable based upon the decision that has been arrived. So these are all factors that has to be taken into account. If you say your paper lives for a longer time rather than has an infantile mortality is an important aspect that I have to think. So in some sense, like Polya said, think before you ink becomes a very important aspect uh, like Dijkstra's discipline of programming, Polya's suggestions. These are all important that should be considered so that it becomes a good paper and a proposal. That's it. Excellent. Yes, uh, and very well said. And and, and sometimes that 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 speed, that slow cook, gives you the staying power, so that you know a medium article might be forgotten in a month. But but if you if you produce a, a you know a well written academic article, it's part of it's part of the system that will be there. And I, I see that challenge in healthcare because you know I'm seeing people just enter the blockchain scene who are asking the same questions. And let's put together a white paper on this topic. And I'm like, maybe if people had put together something a little more solid post white paper, you know, you, you, you do a preprint for archive and that's great. But, you know, sometimes in healthcare, a preprint that's older than six months or a, a year, people are going to say, why isn't that now a published paper? There, there's an expectation that things will graduate to that. And I, it's one of the reasons I like JBBA because it really gives a, a, a forum that, that looks it, it looks the part for for a professional journal as well as has the content that speaks to that 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 quality. Um, uh, uh, P Professor Liu, um, when, you, when you spoke about um, making sure to to fit it into the existing body of literature, where do you see that? Where do you see that intersection and that, and that ability to make that happen? Are, are people starting to pay attention to blockchain focused journals, um, or do you see also a proliferation into the traditional financial journals of blockchain related materials? Um, I actually see both. Um, Sean, you asked a very good question when you talk about the publication speed. Um, I was actually thinking about that. Um, so JEB is definitely great because of its quick turnaround. Because people working in the industry understand the fast-moving nature, whereas in finance journals, it takes you one year or two years for publication, several rounds of reviews. And I also agree with the previous discussion. Um, if you are writing a solid theoretical paper, it's timeless, right? Um, it carries, it takes, it, it, Based to the test of time. Um, and then, Sean, going back to your uh, other question, where do I see people publish? So I still see traditional finance researchers publish in the traditional finance journals because that's where it counts. Uh, but then I see more topics in blockchain. For instance, um, the, the trading nature of Bitcoin, the trading nature of different types of cryptocurrency, those are the paper that uh, are written by people in asset pricing, looking at different trading models of futures and stocks and equity. So and now people are using their existing tools and techniques and testing the cryptocurrency trading, the pricing information. Um, so that is something. And the other thing that I see booming is how the adoption of blockchain technology impact traditional companies. So this comes as Tesla's adoption of Bitcoin and how that's impacting the reporting practice um, because they are probably listed company. So something like that start to come out, not necessarily focusing on blockchain by itself, but how large companies involvement in blockchain leads to different type of regulation and governance issues. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we, we do have, uh, you know, just a little under 10 minutes here here left. And there was a, a, a good comment in the in the chat from um, Professor Lassity, who knows knows a thing or two about good papers. Um, and and uh, as as we as we kind of wrap this up, I want to give people concrete um, suggestions and ways ways to move forward. Um, as as Professor Lassity says, um, make sure that the you know the authors have their um, paper professionally edited before sending it in. It's gonna it's gonna be a lot better. The the, the journal is not your editor. Um, if it, or, or not your copy editor. If you're if you're going to rely on that, they're they're usually dinging you for the fact that it's not in, in final shape. Um, if it comes in, so that's 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 a very good suggestion. 
Um, you know, a, another suggestion that I would put out there is, is, is really understand what it is to do a literature search. And it can be hard in blockchain because you, you, there's not a single uh, indexed database. Um, I'm working with Dell Medical School and, and Artifacts, which is one of the supporters of JVBA and this, this conference, to, for healthcare, really do a survey and create an index library for blockchain and healthcare. But I don't know that all the different sub-industries even have a place, one-stop shop. So you need to look around. You need to do the traditional Google Scholar. And, and in, in healthcare, it's PubMed, but you need to look for those 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 appropriate um, gray literature pieces that are out there. Not just news stories, but but conference papers and things that maybe haven't reached peer review yet, but per, perhaps have some significance. And that can that can be challenging. So give yourself time. Um, uh, Professor Hayes, going to you. Do you have uh, do you have some suggestions, tips, and tricks, as well as those mistakes that you see um, that they kind of pop up time and time and again that people can put on their checklist to to take care of before they even submit. Yeah, and it, as opposed to getting something professionally edited, just if you have friends that um, or colleagues that are, will be willing to read your paper, of course, then you can thank them in the acknowledgments after the fact. But for people especially that aren't native English speakers, and of course, something like blockchain is an international and global technology with people studying it and interested in it all around the world, uh, one of the problems is that then in, in those cases, you may want to consider an English language copywriting service. And there's several of them at a reasonable cost online. The reason for that is not only to make your paper up to a uh, world-class quality, but also because a lot of the nuance in your arguments or in your analysis might be, you might be accidentally misrepresenting or misconstruing yourself, but only because you don't have mastery of technical English, which is not easy to do all the time. I would also just well, one point back to the slowness or the, the mismatch in speed between technological development and publication is that the peer review process can be long and then you might have to revise and resubmit and maybe do that two or three times. And by the time a paper comes out in publication form or even available early online, you know, it's no longer state of the art or it's no longer relevant. And uh, I think there's, people have been trying to speed up peer review for a long time, but there is this problem between uh, quality and ensuring quality and correctness and objectiveness. You can have a high quality paper that's just flawed um, or is incorrect uh, according to the peer reviews. So you, ne you need to have that peer review process. Otherwise, as Sean was saying, you can certainly feel free to publish any essay you want on Medium or other uh, blogging platforms, but that would not be an academic or a scholarly publication. Indeed, valuable, but but a, but a different sort of uh, longevity to it, I would say. Um, uh, and 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 similar question to you, um, uh, Professor uh, Shamus are are you, are you uh, aware of specific mistakes that you've seen, or tips and tricks that you can give to potential authors um, to really help them help move them along? I think you know of late, uh, some of them they try to publish for the requirements rather than that they really want to convey or they got something new which was not existing. I think this is an important aspect and that's how in the coming years, the notion of journals also may change even though now they have made it into cap mode, etc. What would be the way the journals would be in the next five years? No publisher knows because they have to survive in some sense or the other. And so this is an important aspect they have to think. But the important aspect is people need to publish if they are really a rather than a requirement for a project or a government requirements, et cetera, kind of a thing. This is something people have to avoid. This will become natural if the evaluation also becomes uh, natural rather than artificial kind of a thing. Indeed, indeed. And and uh, and, and finally, the, the, the same question to you, uh, Professor Liu. Um, do you have any common mistakes that you, you would steer people away from or, or tips and tricks to help them uh, with, with their submissions? 
Um, mostly the common mistakes is uh, the same as Adam's. Uh, people need to know, um, the, uh, get a research question, make sure your whole paper is consistent around that research question, um, and then consistent with the fun, fun in terms of the fundings. And also, if you think about writing research papers, like starting a business, you're trying to find a gap in the literature. You're finding a unique niche market that has a need that hasn't been met. So I think it's important to um, to know what's missing there, and then you can talk about your contribution. So one thing that I really like to see is review papers at this stage of blockchain tech and business development. Some good review articles that bring people up to the speed. Um, that's something build a uh, build a, a solid foundation. So people, when they write paper later, they look at your read the review paper, and then they have a solid ground. Indeed, and and uh, and and Dr. Jill, Giselle Waters commented in the main feed of, of of making sure keeping a wide net um, when you're looking for things too, not expecting there to be be a single index. And 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 I, I don't see any more questions here. Although I think we have like one minute left for if anyone does have one, I would I would just add one thing too that I find some people coming from industry maybe have a challenge with is that you. You don't want to promote your competition, but you do want to acknowledge that they've done something that's similar because it actually strengthens the argument that you're moving in the right direction. You know, think of it as like that that that, that pitch to the uh, you know the investors. Um, whereas if you act like you have the only game in town, they know that someone else is out there, and you just don't know your field. So you really need to make sure you're including that aspect in there, and and don't be afraid of talking about your limitations. As as a reviewer, I'm actually heartened if I see the author write about the limitations because it's not about having the perfect model or having the perfect research. It's about describing what you've done in enough detail that it's valuable to me and valuable to the other people or people around. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Nakvi, are, are, are we at time or do we do we have some more time? No, we are, we are perfect. Uh, I think we, we can conclude our session now. Uh, thank you very much, Sean, uh, Adam, Jen, Professor Shamsundar. Um, we have uh, another excellent session. The next is on enterprise blockchains. So I would uh, I would request all of you to please uh, join uh, us in that session also. Thank um, you. Thank excellent. you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Sean, as well as Naki, for this wonderful thing. I remember one year back I was there, and uh, uh, I have not traveled in the aircraft till for one year. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye-bye.